Hey everyone, this is Cam Garrity. Welcome back to this should have been a phone call. Today on the show, we have one of my all-time favorite stand-up comedians, Mike Kaplan. You may know Mike from his various appearances on Conan, Late Night with Seth Meyers, The Late Late Show with James Corden, and as a contestant on America's Got Talent. And if you ask me, he should have won on that show. He deserved a golden buzzer, but... Uh, he is here with us today. Uh, he has published many a comedy album, including his latest one, AKA. You can also stream his special Small Dork and Handsome over at Amazon Prime. Mike has a really captivating way of folding in jokes and themes and wordplay into his comedy. I, I can't help but compare it to well-laminated pastry. All of these layers harmonizing into this expertly crafted, finished piece. You'll, you'll hear as we talk how much he thinks through the process and finds influences outside of comedy like Zen Buddhism and other philosophies as he creates and curates his material. I had the pleasure of meeting and working with Mike back in the summer of 2016 for a short time at Bucks Rock's Visual and Performing Arts Camp in Connecticut. And by that point, I was already a huge, huge fan of his. He was one of the comedy counselors there. I was there to teach puppetry and was and still am completely starstruck by him and his talent. This should have been a phone call with my golden buzzer, Mike Kaplan. What, what's your relation with Bucks Rock? You went there as a, as a kid, right? I did from age 11, as early as possible at that time. The value that I would eventually get out of it, I didn't even, you know, hadn't even really scratched the surface in the first, the first couple of years. It was just, it was nice to be in, you know, a, a warm, welcoming, creative environment. And I like had a few friends that I lived with and little by little, like eventually I just, I met, met some kids who became like some of my best friends or are still some of my best friends uh, when I was maybe like 13, 14. And then sort of really started to glean the greater magic of the place. Like during my the school year, I'd been I I'd, I'd just moved, and so I was like starting over at around age thirteen with a bunch of new kids, and I'd never really done that. And so I was and I was kind of shy and introverted at the time. And uh, coming to camp where that was not a weakness, that was sort of a a commonality shared by if not everyone, certainly a lot of folks there. It was just nice to be welcomed, especially like invited to be a part of a, a group of friends that I was like, wow, this is it, it felt like, you know, it, it felt like maybe everyone or a lot of people had that feeling that they were perhaps outcasts in their quote unquote real life. But in this, you know, magical fantasy land for two months of the summer, getting to, you know, be like, oh, there's people outside of my I mean, I feel like I'm I'm fortunate that my my family uh, you know, was loving and kind and supportive as I was growing up. I know not everyone has that experience, but uh, it felt like at the time, like my parents have to tell me that they love me and have to be supportive in this way. But now this was the first time that I was, you know, meeting new people as, you know, a teenager, a budding adult. I was like, oh, these are like the kids at, at my school. I feel like were probably probably like neutral. Maybe some of them were actually nice, but that those seemed like outliers. They seemed like you know anomalous, and it just seemed like you know a a wasteland of rejection of and trying to connect with with people. But for at Bucks Rock, I feel like I didn't really even have to do anything. It was just like you know this heavenly realm, where it's like oh, there are people outside of my like just these new people, a preponderance of people who are compassionate and loving and and kind and welcoming and supportive and creative. Couldn't imagine it never being, not being a part of my life. And so then I did continue to be a, a camper as long as possible, a CIT for a couple of years, a junior counselor, and then eventually a counselor for many years into my uh, early adulthood. And uh, and still, you know, to this day, I will still go back and do uh, stand-up workshops here and there uh, when it makes sense to so wonderful and i i loved that about the camp the summer that we first met uh was was of course my first time there and i had the same kind of experience of being conditioned in my my school life to kind of have walls up about the things that i found found important and so i had a you know would often be catfished growing up of like oh cam tell us all about the puppets that you really love and blah 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 and then they would take that opportunity to 
chastise me or make fun of me. And so when people would actually show enthusiasm and gen- genuine interest at a place like Bucks Rock, it takes you a second to like let your defenses down and, and understand that those people are genuinely warm and compassionate and and wanting to to see those gifts because everybody has them there and everyone knows what it feels to be othered in that way. For sure. I mean, it's, I feel like, t- you know, teenage years, uh, puberty is sort of a time, at, you know, during which you are turning from a child to an adult, you know, whatever that means. And I feel like socially speaking, you know, teenage years might be the time when you sort of like uh, might pull away from your parents and be like, I'm my own person. And, you know, I don't ca- I don't care about the things that you care about anymore. Mom and dad, you know, like I do I do my own thing. And then maybe when you're an adult, you come back to those things or find your new spin on uh, on them or find your own new things or whatever it might be or some combination. And I say all this to like, I remember my own experience of like going from, you know, being a child, like loving my parents sort of unconditionally and then being a teenager where I felt like, you know, I had these experiences that were different than theirs. And they, you know, I it was never like I, I was never like super at odds with them. I wasn't like, you don't understand me, mom and dad. But <laughs> I definitely, you know, I, I felt like I was on my own. I felt like I was cared cared for by them, but that, you know, they couldn't help me. Uh, with my my school troubles, with my friend troubles, and and then you know I remember as eventually as an adult meeting you know meeting my parents on like a human level more than I ever had before, and it's sort of like a I don't know if you we've talked about do you know the the concept of chop wood carry water? I'm not familiar with that. It's from maybe from like Eastern philosophy, maybe Buddhism, maybe Zen. It's sort of like a koan like thing. I don't know what it is, but the quote is before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. Mm -hmm. And, you know, within like, let's say within comedy, uh, the way that it manifests for me is, you know, before you know how to do anything. Like, if you want to be a comedian, what do you do? And you're like, well, you write and you perform. Those are the only things that you can do. I mean, you can learn, you can watch other people, whatever it is. But, like, if you want to do something, well, all you got to do is to do it. And then maybe, you know, years in, decades in, whatever it might be along the way, the equivalent of enlightenment, where let's say, you know, a light bulb goes on and you're like, oh, now I know how to do it. Now I know more. I know better how to do this thing that I didn't know how to do at all before. Well, now that you know that, what do you do? You keep writing and performing. You keep chopping wood and carrying. That's what you do before you know how to do it. And that's what you do after you know how to do it. And so similarly, I feel like as a child, like, what do you do? You ch- The chop wood carry water of life is, you know, live as hopefully openly and lovingly as you can within, you know, within your family, if that's a possibility. And then there, there's this middle stage. And then afterwards, as an adult again, like, hopefully, if everything goes according to some plan, at least, like, I'm like, oh, now... Now I'm sort of now I'm back. I'm back to in a way where I started, which is, again, perhaps, you know, full of childlike wonder and open and, uh, you know, not just trusting and loving and going along with with everything, no matter what. But, you know, that that's sort of like the baseline where I've returned to. And I think of that because of what you said regarding like, you know, your interest in puppetry as it was received perhaps in your school life compared to in the camp life. I mean, like when I was a kid specifically, I'm like, I loved the Muppets. And I'm sure that that's like, you know, a lot of people's entryway into puppets as and might be their their concluding point as well. Like there's sure. the Muppets, I assume, loom large in the, the puppetry world. Then, you know, I feel like there's a sense in which the Muppets and or puppets are quote unquote for kids. And then, you know, the teenage years might be a time when the same kind of distancing from one's family of origin or from one's religion or culture, whatever it might be. Similarly, I could imagine, I could remember being a teenager and thinking like the things that I liked when I was younger, those are children's things, childish things, things to be pushed away or ridiculed or, you know, like separated from. And then you get to be an adult and you're like, oh, I was right. The Muppets are really cool. And like now, you know, knowing you and a few other puppetry enthusiasts and puppeteers in my life, I'm like, you know, I love creativity. I love creative people. I I mean, I feel like everyone is or certainly has the capacity to be a creative person. Like we all continue, uh, whether as our careers or otherwise. And so, I mean, like 
I just I understand I understand what you're saying. Like your experience is is resonant, and also uh, puppets are cool. <laughs> I appreciate that that affirmation. Absolutely. No, I I love that that point, and um, I had not heard that chop wood carry water thing, but I could see all sorts of ways that it applies, and um, even thinking about some of I'm thinking specifically about your your recent album, uh, AKA it kind of has some of those moments as well as from, from the first line of like, if you have to go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom. <laughs> uh, oh yeah. I thank you for sure. Uh, I, I think that uh, the thing, you know, the things that we learn, you know, like I've, I've been learning a lot of uh, sort of Eastern like philosophy and about Buddhism specifically. And so it, it finds its way into, into my comedy, into what I write, into what I think and do, whether sometimes explicitly and sometimes, you know, in varying metaphoric ways. So yeah, that is, I think that is a nice, a nice noticing. Thank you. Thanks for listening. And thank you for your appreciation. So, Mike, I like asking people some random questions to kind of just get the the pores open, so mm-hmm. to speak, of of people thinking and meditating. Uh, what's a book or movie that you found at just the right time for where you were in life at, at mm. that moment? What a great question! I've got a couple. I mean, I'm sure the more I start thinking about it, uh, the more answers there will be. The two that come to mind as like earliest in my life are the book Ishmael by Daniel Quinn and this. Book Needs No Title by Raymond Smullyan. Both of them came into my life, I would say, in my early to mid-20s. Ishmael, I don't remember where or how I found it or heard about it, but I don't know if you've read it. It's told, it's a fictional story about a, essentially a psychic gorilla who is like a Socratic teacher to the hero of the book, who I think is a child, a human child, who learns about human history and the history of agriculture, and that 10,000 years ago was when agriculture was born, and all the implications that had on the way that people lived, which shifted greatly for many people at that time from being leavers into takers in a way like when it became it used to be that you just lived sort of in the hand of god you know like fruit grew on trees and you ate it and if it didn't then you didn't as opposed to then later taking you know the means of production into your own hands and be like now we're going to have lots of this stuff and that created the necessity for jobs the necessity for whole structures of society that weren't necessary before Prior to that, people probably did the equivalent of a couple hours of work a day, maybe. But the eight-hour work day, the five, the forty-hour work week was it, it was innovated at that time for reasons that I mean, some some cultures still don't have that or have it. You know, there's varying spectrums of it, and so that was sort of you know, I'm becoming an adult, a member of society, and so that that was really meaningful. And the other book I found at there's a Barnes and Noble near where my mom lives in New Jersey. And the title caught me immediately. It was called This Book Needs No Title. And I'm like, that's funny. That's good. Uh, like, that is more koan-like, I think, even than the thing. Maybe, maybe it's the same. It's not a competition. It's not a, it's not a co-ompetition. <laughs> and so Raymond Smullyan is a, throughout his life, he was a philosopher, a professor, a logician, a magician, a mystic thinker. Uh, he went. He would go on Carson's Tonight Show at times and talk about philosophy and do magic. And uh, there was a section called Planet Without Laughter. It was basically a little allegory of, he's like, imagine a world much like ours, but on this world, people have forgotten what laughter is or how it works or what it means. Like they know that it, they know that it used to exist. Like it used to be that that laughter was, and it still exists in pockets places. And it was, the analogy is to like some kind of mystic enlightenment, perhaps Zen type understanding that is lacking in our world right now that, you know, some people like a world without a without a 40 hour work week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. An example in the stories that there'd be these laugh masters, like maybe the equivalent of Zen masters who who had the the knowledge of laughter 
and they wanted to go around and help share that. And so people would be like, okay, so what is laughing exactly like physiologically? What is it phonetically? What is it acoustically? And the laugh masters would be like, those aren't the right questions. You know, you can't learn how to laugh genuinely by being like, okay, ha 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 ha. Like if you do almost, it's like there's an uncanny valley. Like if you know what true laughter is, then you can spot what fake laughter is. But if you don't know what true laughter is, then you might not know the difference. And so these laugh masters would put on presentations where sometimes they would just do backflips and then sometimes in the audience people would start laughing and be like oh I understand what laughing is <laughs> and the other people would be like oh me too ha 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 and they're like okay well some of you and so I remember reading that and the the reason that this is such a memorable experience for me is like I would maybe shortly thereafter sometime maybe a year a couple years later have my first experience with uh mushrooms with psychedelic you know psilocybin mushrooms and But before that, I remember reading this story and understanding there was an allegory or an, anal an analogy being made. Like, you know, this world is to laughter as our world is to X. But I didn't have enough of an understanding in my own life experience to really anything other than intellectually understand, like, what is X? What is that thing that the analogy is talking about until I did mushrooms? And then I was like, oh, it's this, whatever this is. Like, and I'm not saying that I now have complete, permanent, all the time access to an enlightened state of being, just that I witnessed something or I experienced something that at that point now, like, filled in the gaps that were left by, you know, that story that I'd read just prior to that. So I feel like the question, the question that the way that you ask the question is like, what came into your life at the exact right time? Like, I don't know if there would have been a wrong time for that book or for those books to come into my life, because I mean, sometimes the greatest books, like you read them earlier in your life and they have a certain meaning to you, like the Muppets. And then you read yeah. them later in your life and you're like, oh, like these aren't just dancing socks. These are real funny, brilliant for adults dancing socks. So, you know, chop wood, carry water continues but yeah so those those are some of the books that spring to mind immediately that's great uh and as someone who's not ever done mushrooms before uh ha 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 ha, ha <laughs> i guess <laughs> very good uh do you remember a time another random question do you rem remember a time when you had a really delicious moment of schadenfreude of watching people to and taking pleasure in their pain hmm. the answer is I'm sure is yes, though how I wish it were no. And perhaps perhaps a, a meta, a, a moment of meta schadenfreude is whatever moment I figure, whatever time, whatever I pick, I, I in this moment am striving to be better than my past self, the the kind of past self who would take joy in the suffering of others. And, and because I think that when we do that, there is also a kind of suffering that exists within us that, you know, they say we see the world not as it is, but as we are. Here's here's another a tale from, I think, Buddhism that maybe I heard first from Ramdas, who I'm a big fan of. Yeah. I remember Ramdas sharing this story of a uh, a Buddhist monk seated in meditation and uh, a brutish oafish samurai comes by like an unkempt, aggressive, like scary looking, violent samurai. And the samurai comes to the monk and says, I hear that you know things and I would like you to teach me about heaven and hell. And the monk looks up at him and says, you like I can't teach you anything like that because you're not the right person to learn those things. Look at you. The kind of being that you are is not the kind of person that I could teach this to. And this angers the samurai and the samurai in what seems to be the nature of the samurai pulls out his sword and is about to strike down dead the monk in anger. And at that moment, right before that happens, the monk points up at him and says, that's hell. And then... The samurai realizes what the monk has done, risking his own life to teach him the lesson that he requested. And he drops the sword and like drops to his knees and prayerfully just like, you know, clasps his hands in gratitude and is like, thank you. And then the monk looks at him and says, and that's heaven. Wow. And yeah, I mean, what a, a beautiful story, a powerful thing that when I think about it, I've, gr I've grown up secularly Jewish in a, a society 
where Judaism, Christianity, Islam, those are the the main mythic structures that govern our lives. Those are the stories that we hear the most. God uh, of Abraham. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The yeah. Abrahamic religions. And part of that, I believe, is like, I don't specifically believe that after this life, depending how you lived it, you either receive eternal damnation or eternal reward. But I know that there, in the in the language of our culture, that that concept exists, and there are people who do believe that. But it seems to me that whenever somebody is like, "You're going to hell," and then if they enumerate, they're like, "These are the kinds of sufferings that you're going to." Ex-. I'm like, those sufferings are existing like within that person at that time. The the hatred, the anger, the fear, all of that, what seems like negativity. And so like, even when I'm like mimicking that, I'm like, you know, it, it feels a specific way that like, I'm happy to play act it and to be like, well, that's not, that's not me. But in that moment, it is kind of, you know, a role that is taking on. And so I strive to not visit that land more often than is uh, necessary. So my, my goal is, here's another sort of tangential aside that will keep us circling this drain. The way that I talk about pet peeves is to say that I personally don't conceive of myself as having pet peeves because I think that, you know, I mean, I think that there are injustices in the world. There are big challenges that are important to face. And there are, there's certainly little annoying things that happen here and there, but I, I'd rather not focus too much on the little annoying things by giving them the power of naming them and being like, this is a thing. And also all that said, if I were to have a pet peeve, Like perhaps even my own having of a pet peeve would be a pet peeve of mine and why I strive to not have a pet peeve. One of my pet peeves would be if I were to have them. And I feel like this is all sort of like a a penance that I do upon myself to like, if I ever want to talk about pet peeves, I'm like, well, I have to, I want to talk. I get to talk about them as mindfully as this to make sure that I communicate as many dimensions of this, of these perspectives as I can. Honking horns unnecessarily, I feel like is, is something that I'm like- historically would wish to not to be other than it is so i guess in general the category of thing that you know where i have felt the the joy of schadenfreude is like you know somebody cuts me off in traffic and then ends up behind me or ends up weaving in and out and getting cut off themselves you know like somebody who's trying to get one over on people and ending up through their own machinations getting one over on themselves or having one gotten over by the circumstances yeah, so I, I don't know that I can think of any other specific iterations of that. And I guess I'm I'm glad to not be able to at this point. So uh, ne- next time, past me, past Schadenfreude enjoying me. But yeah, I hope that I hope that that'll do for an answer. Something that I'm I'm curious about because from what I understand of comedy and 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 writing and developing stand up, you do five minutes here, you do ten minutes there, and you sort of cobble together an hour. It, uh, that's at least for the the proto stand up comedian. What I love about your work is how interconnected the material is. So I guess I'm I'm wondering how are you able to to do that and and workshop material. You know, is are you constructing modules like or is that something that's only able to develop over time? I'm fascinated by how you you craft the jokes and and the the arcs. Thank you for asking. Uh, so I certainly can only answer the question for myself. I'm sure that it, if I if I can answer for anyone, it's only for myself. Like so there's other comedians. Oh, sure. No. And I, I'm totally mm-hmm. talking about like your 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 brand of, of oh, sure. writing specifically. I appreciate it. So. The first hour of comedy that I recorded, I recorded in 2009, I believe. And that was, as you, as you, I think, rightly have gleaned, I'd started doing comedy, really pursuing it in 2002. And over the course of those seven years, I wrote hundreds of jokes, thousands of jokes, however many. And then I put them together. I would say cobbled, cobbled together. Definitely the very first time that I did an hour. It was absolutely a cobbling. Even the, I remember the first time I did a half hour and 
I believe that I had at that time literally exactly one half hour of jokes. Like I at that time wasn't really doing crowd work or riffing or anything. It was all written on the page and then spoken exactly as such symphonic like, you know. The, mm-hmm. the uh, mm-hmm. an orchestral symphony is written. Every note is written. Every dynamic is written. There's still some creativity to be gleaned in the the presentation thereof. But you know, people aren't adding notes that weren't written. As then, some comedians are more jazz, you know, improvisers like yeah. riffing. And I enjoy these days both both methods crafting a finished product that goes exactly so like a symphony and also in the creation thereof and also at other times just for for its own sake the sake of the process i do enjoy being present in a moment and creating things that have never been said before uh or in new orders that have never happened before so to get back to the question theoretically which i'm still in the middle of answering that half hour I did in Agawam, Massachusetts, I wrote, I had a piece of paper, just like a sheet, sheet of eight, eight and a half by 11 printer paper. And I wrote down all of my jokes in the order that they had to go. Because if I forgot, I, I probably did like forget one at one point. And I'm like, well, hey, everyone, I'm just going to remember when I was talking about food 10 minutes ago. Here's one more food joke. Please ignore that it's in the middle <laughs> of this uh, relationship chunk. And I probably wouldn't have had, you know, the wherewithal to be as loosey goosey fun with it as the way that I just presented it now but that was I was like oh no I forgot I because if I if I didn't do it at all exactly as it was then it wouldn't get done at that time and then I remember doing my first hour that I think I did maybe at Brown University by that point I was a little further in I had an hour of comedy I had more than that maybe but I still wrote myself like a you know kind of a cheat sheet that I kept on stage with me where I had maybe like 10 to 12 like major categories and then eat in each of those categories, 10 to 20 jokes that I was like, OK, I have it all ordered out. And then like over the course of years, if I would like perform at a college, sometimes I would introduce I would have that sheet of paper with me if I needed it. And I would like read off to the students as a joke at the beginning. I'd be like, here's our syllabus. We're going to be talking about these topics <laughs> in this order, you know, like food. And that'll go into, of course, you might food and dating and then movies and then Jews, obviously one following right after another to the next. And then that really did help me develop like it's in the beginning it used to be like all the jokes were disconnected like it just you know i wasn't writing like large treatises on one topic i would have you know some jokes about my life some jokes about that were just absurdities some jokes that were wordplay some jokes that were politically motivated some jokes that were about pop culture and then the first album like was the best of all of this just the ones that worked the most to me and to audiences And I did them in the order that made sense. We're like, oh, like this is the one that I end with, of course, because it's it consistently gets the biggest reaction. And that's what you put at the end. And this one goes at the beginning because it's the one that helps everyone get on board immediately and get into it. And that was the way it went for me for, you know, several, several years, at least. I mean, if you go back to the beginning of my comedy career, many years and then. The third hour of comedy that I recorded and released is the the special that I believe you mentioned when we first started, Small, Dork, and Handsome, which is still, like, the jokes all, for the most part, uh, you could listen to most of the tracks out of order and you wouldn't be confused because each track was like its own set of jokes. But I did conclude with a time travel joke and I started the set by saying at the very first beginning of the hour by saying in conclusion a joke about time travel but first all the rest of this or what have you and i remember that was something that was like oh this is like a fun bonus joke to do when i thought of it and then during the course of the hour there was like one story that i started early on and didn't finish and you wouldn't have known that I didn't finish it necessarily if you didn't know if you weren't me and didn't know all the pieces of the story but I eventually like I did later come back to it in a way that was like enjoyable to make people be like oh I did I forgot that we hadn't finished that piece of it and that was a sort of a discovery for me like formally like you know with respect to the form of what I was doing I was like oh that's a fun thing to do and so I've like utilized that moving forward I mean in the most recent album, AKA, it is thematically mostly connected and structurally formed in a way that 
if you listen to the last track first, it wouldn't make sense because you hadn't listened to uh, a lot of it would make sense, but you wouldn't get the full experience out of it because the final track is in some ways, you know, a summation, a conclusion of of that which comes before it. And like that it's this like because okay so the one the one album that came out in between small dork and handsome and aka is called no kidding and that was the first album that i wrote specifically like planning to try to make all the jokes stem from the same theme and the theme was not wanting children which is why i called it no kidding because i'd had i had an experience when i was around like my early 30s i was dating a woman uh, who I loved very much, and about a year in, we broke up because we had we had been having conversations about children, and we found that we were in different places with our desires for them. Me, not sure if I ever wanted them. Uh, her, sure that she wanted them, like, multiples soon. But it was something that, because of that conflict, like, it was this really fertile ground for comedy. I then, then I was like, oh, maybe I could create a whole hour of comedy or as close to it as need be, a whole album, if not about this topic, you know, sort of stemming from this topic. And so I was like, I'd never tried that before. And I was like, well, I'm going to try it. And if I, if I don't and I can't, then that's fine. But so many of the things in my life that I have accomplished started because I was like, well, I'm going to try it. And if it doesn't work, then, then I won't do it. But better to try and fail than to not try. At, like, if you don't try, you almost certainly won't succeed. So I tried. And then... In uh, I feel like I guess in some ways, like the birth of this of things being structured in a certain way was with Small, Dork and Handsome and the birth of like things being themed in a certain way was uh, with No Kidding. And those two were married together in a combination of form and content that AKA became, which the way that I would put it sometimes is that the first hour of comedy that I did, the first several hours were all jokes that I cared about, but they all weren't necessarily about things that I cared about. And still, now, AKA, I think, is full of jokes that I care about about things that I care about. And now, the thing that's similar to how I started is I still do record all my ideas. I still do, like, any any idea that I think could be fun, wh however important it is, I jot it down. But then, I feel like the lesson I learned with AKA is that I can decide what to focus on more, what to write more jokes about. And the more jokes I write, then the more connections I can find between jokes. Like some of the things in AKA where there are jokes that are like similar concepts or related in structure. Some of them were just accidental discoveries, kind of the, the equivalent of being a million monkeys, you know, working at a million typewriters or infinite or whatever <laughs> yeah. it is, uh, to the point that I'm like, oh, hey, I asked. I discovered something. Hey, look, give me page 17 again. And now give me page 393,432. Here's something. If these two things go together, then they create something new and beautiful and greater than the sum of either of their parts. Kind, you know, To go back to answer your question directly, when I do sets around New York City, the sets are, uh, they could be 10 minutes, 15, 20. I'm not, if I'm working on like, you know, a show like AKA, that is like a cohesive hour or the hour that I'm working on now, which is called Imperfect. The only way to work on that hour in total is to have an hour to do. Like I can definitely take, you know, five to 10 to 15 minute chunks of it and work those out in front of, uh, you know, in smaller sets. But I can't, you know, like I remember... At, I think the point at which I was getting stretched beyond the capacity to do this, where the ending of the new show that I'm working on involves there being various things like seeds planted along the way. And I remember doing like a 15 or 20 minute set and trying to plant all those seeds and be like, let me practice the way that this is going to end. But at a certain point, the show got too full and it became almost impossible to do everything that I needed to in that short a time. So I was like, well, I guess I have to play the whole game to get to the, you know, the ending that I want to. But it is something that that does happen sort of uh, piecemeal, at least in the beginning. And so I think that, you know, along the way, there's uh, I'm telling jokes. I'm you know doing the chopping wood and carrying water of like writing jokes, thinking of jokes, telling jokes. And then always being sort of on the alert for grander patterns and grander connections that can become a really fun, meaningful tapestry 
of an hour of comedy, uh, you know, that can be worked out on the joke level, on the chunk level, on the small set level, and then ultimately has to be played on the hour long level to find out if the does the hour how does the hour go? I need an hour to find out how the hour goes. No, that's so that's so that that's a wonderful insight. It reminds me in a way there's a an improv exercise where you're given a task to illustrate and it could be something like serving ice cream or giving birth or what whatever the the task is and you have to act out the same scene with 5 seconds, 30 seconds and 2 minutes and how do you fill how do you fill that time giving both the same amount and more information in within those those parameters. Oh it yeah. Kind of reminds me of it seems to rhyme with what you're what you're saying there. Yeah, you know, I've I've seen that improv game played in the reverse as well, if not the direction that you it seems like you were saying like where they would do a, a, a group would do a minute scene and then do it in 30 seconds, then in 15, then in 5, you know, and then in 1, you know, just to you know, just yeah. <laughs> um but I, I'd never thought about it going in the other direction, like starting with like just the smallest simple thing and then drawing it out and creating more and more out of it. I like that a lot. Uh the final piece of this I'll say is that two of the favorite things that I love to do in comedy, uh, one is to create these orchestral symphonies, and the other, like I said, is to create these sort of jazz jazz riff shows, you know, where I've had I've had these experiences where sometimes I'll be in front of an audience that is really into just whatever is happening, and then I will explore and experiment as far from the plan as possible. Like I have the bones of a show that I could, you know, construct into the dinosaur that they like, ooh, and ah about. But I'm like, what if I take all these bones and I'm like, I don't even need these bones. I've got like just a bunch of other cartilage here and uh, all all this mortar, and I don't even need the bricks. And sometimes over the course of, you know, piecing together brand new things or, you know, creating a new show, new connections will form. Be like, oh, look. Yeah, yeah. Page 17, page 394,000, whatever it was. I did a show over the New Year's Eve weekend in Batavia, Illinois. And uh, I asked the crowd if there were any, I was talking about being Jewish. I asked if there were any Jews in the crowd. And there was one guy raised his hand and he was a man named Sergei. And it turned out he was born in Russia. I remember asking him, I was like, oh, so how long have you lived here? And the person that he was with, oh, he doesn't actually, uh, he lived in Israel for a while and he's been here for three years. And then at a certain point, I was like, oh, it sounds like maybe this guy's a spy. Like you, you were born here, you lived here, you're here for the, like, it's very difficult to track you down. And then I asked the other person, uh, the person that he was with, where were you born? And she paused for a really long time. And I was like, oh, like, I'm like, truly, I'm like, are you spies? I don't have to ask any more questions, you know? <laughs> and and then over the course of that hour, like, that became, like, you know, a, a fun, like, reference point to revisit every once in a while. You know, if another joke that I told normally outside of the context of Sergei, the Jewish spy and his partner in Batavia, Illinois, now with that new context, like, there was, like, a, a slightly new perspective, a new frame that... Every other, you know, joke might be able to be seen through if it made sense to call it back. So I feel like in general, when I'm performing, I'm striving to be open to creating new connections or finding new connections between things that already existed or new things that I'm just discovering. And so over the course of the years that it takes to hone and bloom and then prune and then present and record an hour like AKA or the hour I'm working on now enough of those things happen it's sort of, i guess it's sort of i never thought about it like this but uh he had, there's a quote by this writer it's something like i only sit down to write when inspiration strikes fortunately it strikes every morning at 9 a.m. on the dot oh. <laughs> and there's also actually uh, a quote in the context of the book the spiritual text infinite patience yields immediate results which is like, you know, the same way that if everyone learned everything that I have learned about uh, Tibetan debate and Buddhist ontology, then in an hour and five, in, in a year and five minutes, hell, I could tell you the greatest punchline in the world. Absolutely. When you meet people, and I, I suppose, you know, just with friends and family as well, do you get pitched a lot of jokes regularly? Like, are th there are a lot of people who think like, oh, that really funny knock-knock joke, I should tell Mike about it because he could use it on stage. Hmm. 
not knock knock jokes, I suppose, but observations and and other witticisms. Sure, I so it's a good question, and I'm pausing to answer because the the answer I feel like there's a lot of answers. I feel like the classic version of this that absolutely does happen in the life of many comedians, including myself at various points, is like the idea of like a comedian, let's say, at a day job or at a family gathering and someone else says something perhaps funny, perhaps intended to be funny uh, in the moment. And maybe it is and maybe, you know, there's a spectrum and humor is subjective. And then, you know, the, I feel like the classic is like, oh, you could use this in your act. Yeah. And there are many times that that has happened. Absolutely. When it happens, it's noteworthy. And it happens to enough comedians that it's, I feel like, a not like its own genre of comedy. But I've seen a lot of comedians tell a story on stage of like, can you believe that this person after a show or this sort of, you know, well-intentioned but a little off-base relative or this clueless coworker who, you know, everybody who isn't a comedian thinks they have some idea of of what comedy is and how it works and my I have a lot of friends who are funny who are comedians and a lot of friends who are funny who aren't comedians and I would say the funnier somebody is, the more creative someone is, like the more likely they are to be aware and mindful of the idea that most creative people are creating their own their own work. Every once in a while I have, you know, somebody will email me like a, a cold email and they're like, hey, I think I could write comedy for you because I understand, you know, your voice and the kind of things that you talk about and care about. And I was like, well, the one thing that you don't as much understand then is that for me, creating the comedy is a large part of the joy of it. And so I would say most of the people in my life who are close to me are either comedians themselves or other creative people, other artists, or artistically minded to the point that they have that kind of awareness of the creation of comedy or art and and its purview as being personal usually to the person creating and of course there are comedians who have writers and there are people who collaborate and work together uh and right now my girlfriend who uh i love very much and live with is a, a collaborator with me on the comedy that i'm doing now which is a a different thing than a person more out of the blue saying like here's a joke for you it's funny because it's so so infrequently, I think, you know, every once in a while, I, I, I think of this as a joke that like I have a friend who's a rapper and every once in a while, like I enjoy writing, writing rhymes and lyrics. And so sometimes I think of a rhyme and I'm like, oh, man, I, I should go to my rapper friend and be like, hey, you could use this in a song. Uh, or if I have a dancer friend and I do something like cool or different or weird with my foot and be like, hey, have you ever done this with your foot in a dance? You know, like it it mostly doesn't make sense outside of comedy, but. It's such an interesting dichotomy where like comedy is one of the art forms that I think seems like it's easiest to do. Comedy looks like often just talking yeah. and most people can do that. And so it's sort of like the discrepancy between how easy it looks and it is actually, I mean, anybody can sign up for an open mic and get on stage and talk. And then to be successful at it, to make audiences laugh consistently, that's the thing that takes time and work and effort and skill and dedication of a certain kind. The other thing, to in answer to your question, I have a very specific memory of being at lunch with my mother sometime since the pandemic began. And it must have been after vaccination because we were in a building. It was just us in a restaurant and then one, one other party that was like just across the restaurant. And maybe while I was in the restroom, my mom struck up a conversation with them. I think maybe they had a little baby. And so when I got back, they were engaged in a conversation. They had found out that I was a comedian because my mom is proud of me and tells people. There was an older gentleman, like maybe the grandfather of, of the family that was there. And he was like, oh, so you're a comedian. How about these? And then he tells four jokes that some of them were like kind of kids- kids type jokes, you know, joke book type jokes. And he wasn't giving, he wasn't telling me to them to be like, you should tell these jokes. You but he's like, oh, you're a comedian. You like jokes. Here are some jokes that I love. And I also, I do love jokes. And I, so I, 
very frequently, I, I've heard a lot of jokes. So very frequently people are like, hey, I, I've got a joke for you. I often have heard it, but I remember this particular man in that particular restaurant on that particular day. I don't think, I don't know if I'd heard any of the jokes that he told me. And so I was like, oh, and I don't remember any of them now, though I think I did like jot them down later in my journal, like when I got home. I more remember the experience, sort of like the communion, which is like the the beauty of comedy, the beauty of humor and jokes and art right. in general. The shared moments. Exactly. Exactly. And so I don't even I don't remember the letter of the law of what was said, but I do remember the spirit of that time. And so I think I guess the in conclusion to answer this question, the uh, you know, the classic way that everyone speaks standardly, the difference between, you know, an offering of a joke in that in that spirit compared to like the idea if somebody was truly like you should do this in your act, you must do this. Like I I have an idea for you. I know how to I know how you should do your thing more than you know how to do your thing is maybe, you know, in the extreme what it could feel like. It's sort of like uh, I'm reminded of a thing that Ernst Bulova, who, uh, you know, with his wife Ilsa founded Bucks Rock, said once that I that really stuck with me. That sort of, you know, the spirit of like the, you know, the Montessori education that he received that led him to open the camp in the way that he did, where you get to do what you choose to do and you're not told to go somewhere specific at a certain time. And he said something like, children don't like to be taught, but they do like to learn. And that's something that makes sense to me and like resonates as an yeah. adult, that we're all children like that constantly. And so I feel like the idea of like somebody saying like, tell this joke is, you know, <laughs> we don't like to be told what to do, but we do like to, you know, receive gifts of moments of information, of fun, of jokes, of these these shared experiences. So, yeah, I feel like. The how of it is usually done innocently. And if it's not, if it's done uh, aggressively or ignorantly in a way that is off-putting, well, then maybe I will do something in my act, uh, but not the way that they intended. Yeah. <laughs> I did also want to ask about the I in comedy because, and you've sort of already elaborated on this a little bit, but wanting to be authentic in your storytelling on stage versus relaying true moments or augmented moments that actually happen to you in real life. Do you have a philosophy on how much you reveal or not, or is it really just depending on the moment, depending on the story, this is what I'm going to tell people about in the audience. Uh, good question. Here's a couple answers. If I'm talk if if I'm the only person uh, who is impacted by the thing that I'm saying, then then I will go with my gut uh, on stage. Like I'm happy to share. I'm pretty much an open book. You know, there's things that I'm willing to talk about more readily. Things that I have written jokes about and mined for comedy and continue to. This is to say. If somebody else is involved in a story, if I'm like, oh, here's like a funny story, but it's about my relationship or it's about a friend of mine or it's about a person who I know, you know, like obviously it's like an anonymous stranger on the street. Then I feel like that is like I'm not going to, you know, blow up somebody's spot and being like, and this is what they looked like and this is what their social security number was, which I can tell from meeting people on the street. Yeah, absolutely. And so I guess in my relationship, uh, generally speaking, I feel like Rini, my girlfriend, trusts my my general judgment of like what to share or not share about our life together or other people in her life you know like let's say her family members and so usually before i would talk about anyone who's not me who is in my life on stage if there's any doubt or any any concern that they might wish to be a more private person than i would make them then i would have that conversation with them most of my my dad jokingly said, like, when I started doing comedy, he's like, no dad jokes, you know, <laughs> and uh, my mom has on the other side of the spectrum, she's like, anything is fair game. And like, there are certainly things that I have thought, you know, and experienced and written jokes about that. I'm like, I'm not yet ready to tell this story or this joke about this person in my life. Without, let's say, giving that I would want to give them a heads up and have a conversation with them about the joke. But I'd say that's 
that's the general my my general answer would be for things that are that impact only me however that means because in the, like the the language of Teek Nhat Han uh he's just like we all like inter are you can't exist on your own without anyone else like we are a part of nature society the universe in a way that you know a flower can't exist without dirt and sun and water like there's no flower by itself and there's no us there's no me by myself but on the spectrum of other people being involved to other people not being as much involved if it's closer to that end i share abundantly and if other people are involved then i would like i would converse with them about it before sharing other people's stories that are also my story as well. Does that get to some of what you are looking for? Oh, totally. Totally. No, I, and I guess the, the third part of that that I have sort of was curious about is, you know, when you have audience interactions like Sergey or on AKA, you talked about the woman who was able to guess uh, mm. Moe's Bloody Mary, mm -hmm. for instance, um, and how much of those experiences do you want to, uh, like, th th that they actually happen or, uh, you know, maybe sometimes half happen and you're able to construct the rest of it mm. uh, for the purposes of, uh, telling telling that story on stage and and being a, a storyteller and trying to hit the right punchline and such. Sure, thank you. Uh, so, for example, the one that you brought up from AKA, that truly did happen. And up until that point, had never happened before. The one tweak to the way that I say it, the, the difference between the 100% literal truth and the way that I presented on, on the album is I believe I probably say something like, it never happened before or since. And at one, I think it might have happened again one time other than that. But to be a stickler for the letter of the law of that truth didn't seem as important as presenting the spirit of the story, which was that this person in the audience had said a surprising, wonderful, hilarious thing that I was able to continue to share with future audiences for their enjoyment. And I would say that for the most part, the things that I that I say, most of them are literally true. Like if I'm presenting something and you're like, is that true or is it not true? Like I used to have a joke where I would tell, I was like, sometimes people come after up to me after shows and they ask me like, are those things all really true? Like, are you really a vegan? Are you really Jewish? Are you really growing a beard? <laughs> so I feel like, you know, the same way that there are there are some films or documentaries and some films are complete fiction. Some books are nonfiction. Some books are novels. Art of almost every kind has versions of it where it's like, this is a true story. And then versions of it where it's, this is a made up story. And stand up comedy, it also has that. I'd say I'd say most of the people that I know and that I could think of are people who are doing nonfiction comedy. Like not to say that every single thing that they say is factually accurate but that they're speaking the spirit of their real experience like your maria bamford's like people talking about their personal lives or people talking about like political commentary like you know kamau bell or hari kondabolu or you know your your tigs or aparna nonchalas even like various absurdists like uh, like joe firestone or nick vaderat no, nobody is any one thing but these are all people who are you know speaking from a real place of themselves. And then, I mean, on the on the other side of things also, which isn't to say that if you're a fiction writer or, you know, creating a, a non-documentary film that you're not speaking or creating from your heart or your soul. Uh, like, the, I guess the equivalent in comedy would be like a character yeah. or like a person like Anthony Jeselnik, who is telling jokes that are clearly not the things that he truly believes because they are little pieces of artful, uh, I don't know how to, how to say it, but each one exists in its own little world and he has, you know, a through line of a character that is this arrogant, malevolent being, but that in his real life he is a kind, compassionate human being. So this is all to say, I would never. it would never occur to me to write a joke from a perspective that isn't mine. It's difficult for me to even conceive of it like almost everything in my act stems from either something that happened that's true in my my actual personal life or the world as I see it around me or the world as I see it within me, whatever it might be. Yeah. And so I feel like I was talking with a, a friend of mine. Do you know there's a comedian, Chris Gethard, who oh, sure. mainly tells true stories from his life. And 
my friend that I was talking with about Chris Gethard, he actually, he, I think Chris and I were on a show together and my friend was at the show and talked to Chris afterwards. And he was like, why do you only tell like the truth? And Chris said something like, I guess it's because like I'm not creative enough to come up to make stuff up, <laughs> which is a funny thing to say that has yeah. maybe a truth to it, but also I think is not the whole truth. Like it takes a different skill to create made up worlds. It takes a different skill to discover and share your own world and yeah. to curate those moments from your own life. Exactly. Are there times when I might say something that is embellished from the literal experience that happened? Perhaps. But if there's ever a way, if there's a way to say it where the truth is, the literal truth is communicated or the metaphorical or metaphysical truth is communicated without sacrificing anything, without sacrificing, you know, the humor, the meaning, like then my goal is to do that. I want people to know what's real and what's not real. I don't want to do pranks on people. I don't want to trick people. I, you know, for a moment or for some portion of the presentation, sometimes what a setup is, is leading someone to think one thing and then, surprise, it's another thing. But after the whole, after the joke is done, after the chunk is done, after the show is done, I would like for people to have an, a true understanding as possible of who I am and what is real about my life and about the things that I that I have said. That's that's awesome. And I, I, I think you've done it not that you need affirmation from me at oh. all but uh, i i would definitely say that you've been able to accomplish that thank you I, I i'll add just one one joke that i remember from early uh, early on that i wrote i wrote something like uh i was just in los angeles and there was a, a horrible earthquake and it destroyed everything at the etch-a-sketch museum <laughs> and the thing about that joke is that none of it is true <laughs> At that point, I had never even been to L.A. I hadn't experienced an earthquake, and there is certainly no such museum. So the only thing that was true is I thought a silly thing. And so, like, there is certainly comedy fiction exists. Uh, but, yeah, but in stand-up and in my stand-up in particular, I strive for, as much as possible, the truth. As, as we start to wrap up, uh, curious if if you were talking to Mr. or Mrs. Hollywood, uh, what's a what's a dream location that you'd like to tour to, or uh, th if you've already been to return to? There are many places that I love performing. I mean, right now, since the pandemic began, and then since since vaccinations occurred, such that I can go some places in ways that seem safe and healthy and possible. I mean, I'm kind of just grateful to go anywhere that people want me to be, yeah. that I'm invited. Some of my favorite places to perform include Portland, Oregon, uh, San Francisco, Austin, Texas, Atlanta and Athens, uh, Minneapolis, Chicago, Boston, New York, where I live, of course, D.C., kind of like most of your like cities that have... I was going to say, those are kind of like the tent poles of a comedy tour. Yeah, S Seattle. Uh, my, my girlfriend's mom and some family live in Kansas City. I've also, I performed in Salt Lake City last year for the first time in a while, and I had a great time there. Durham, North Carolina has been in, very enjoyable. Asheville, North Carolina. Charleston, North Carolina. Like, a lot of places in North Carolina are really nice. But yeah, uh, just kind of anywhere that there's an audience that wants to see me do what I do. How, uh, if people do want to see you do what you do, how can they learn more about you and your work? Um, so Mike Kaplan is my name, and it's spelled in this weird way that if you know how to spell it, is very helpful, and if you don't, it's not. Uh, it's M-Y-Q-K-A-P-L-A-N, and if you search for Mike Kaplan spelled like that, I'm on pretty, you know, most of the, the social medias, and my website is MikeKaplan.com. I do have a new, a newish newsletter, a newish letter that I call Artie Har Har's, and it's at MikeKaplan.substack.com, and every week I send out for free one 
email full of uh, jokes and other fun things and also uh, has information about where I'll be. And then you can also subscribe for more of those throughout the week, just bonus funds. And uh, and then also uh, I have my podcasts uh, that you can find. You're listening to this. You can probably find a podcast somewhere. One is called The Faucet. Uh, one is called Broccoli and Ice Cream. The faucet I just spout off alone, uh, stream of consciousness style, usually. Broccoli and ice cream, I talk to people about the work of their life as represented by the broccoli and the joys of their life as represented by ice cream. And uh, you will be a guest, I, I'm optimistic, in 2022. Huh. And I, I've said it here, and so now it's... Uh, <laughs> It's and I like the truth it's out in the so, world. Yes, um, there we go. <laughs> and what if I was like, and I need you to edit that part out? Uh, yeah, <laughs> what would that even mean? But uh, so anyway. I guess the main way, if people can see me live, like my tour dates are usually on my website, and I usually uh, send them into the social media spheres as well as into my newsletters. So there's lots of ways to find out where I'll be, and if you're in a place where I'll be and it's comfortable and safe and healthy for you to come see me in that place, uh, I'm happy to have you there, listener. And in the meantime, I also do, you know, since the pandemic began, there's a lot of online things happening, like podcasts as well as live stream shows, and so those are happening as well and also the number one thing uh in conclusion where i would love for people to take in the things that i create other than my live performances is the, the albums and the specials that i've created which include aka the most recent one and several others going back and they are available where most of the places where comedy albums and such can be found so thank you uh, that could have been the whole podcast is me telling you where you can find <laughs> me and my work in other places but thank you for asking and for having me absolutely well and all the links are are in the show notes and uh, we'll definitely direct people that way uh mike one last thing you have taught me so much about the possibilities of comedy and storytelling I think your art has been and for a long time will continue to be a light in the dark. And um, please keep us uh, all in wonder as you so wonderfully do. Thank you so much. That's very kind of you to say. Thanks so much for coming on. We did it. You came to the end of another episode of This Should Have Been a Phone Call. So much thanks to Mike for stopping by to chop wood and carry water with us. If this is your first time listening, there are plenty of other episodes of the show. Just go to phonecallpod.com and you can listen to all of them right now. Please give us a follow at phonecallpod wherever you get your social media. And if you're feeling brave, I always appreciate a good review or comment over at Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. It helps the show grow, but it also keeps Tom Hanks from growing a mustache, so I definitely appreciate that. We'll see you next time on This Should Have Been a Phone Call. Oh, and one more thing. I love you. You are enough. Keep going.